let's start with defense. Um, you know, we've seen this trend of government agencies increasingly embracing startups like Andrel versus the broader, often more mature companies, even mature tech companies that they've typically worked with. Why is that shift occurring? I think there's a lot of reasons, you know, that we went through this 30 year period after the Cold War where the, you know, risks to the country were kind of unclear, where we, you know, went through total superiority and then counterinsurgency, counterterrorism. And we're kind of re-entering this era of great power conflict and trying to figure out who are the types of people that we need to work on the core problems. Uh, and a lot of those people have been working in Internet companies, right. op optimizing ads and figuring out ways to share 140 characters with their friends more effectively. Um, and we need to draw some of those people back into these areas of national significance. I remember um, at the beginning of sort of when government agencies started to look at working more closely with tech companies, Google was there. Um, but there was a big blowback inside the company, its employees, and its sort of um, its vibe was to not work with government agencies. Did it miss an opportunity there, do you think? Well, I mean, one of the benefits of a democratic society is that you don't have to work on things you don't want to work on. This is obviously very different than the civil military fusion that we see in uh, some of our adversary countries. Um, I have, you know, no issue with Google employees saying they didn't want to work in defense. Um, but at the same time, you know, in 2016, 2017, it was plausible to believe that globalization worked uh, and that closer uh, interaction with countries like China, Russia, Iran, yeah. uh, were going to draw them into the global community. And I think in 2024, it's much harder to make that argument, obviously. Um, Trey, at the top, um, I mentioned the now public companies that Founders Fund has invested in early, and we're in this new era of gen AI. Steve Cohen was on air yesterday saying, um, it's not yet a bubble. We don't even know who the winners and losers are. You look at early stage startups all day. Um, where are we heading? Do you think that we're going to see incumbents continue to dominate this shift, or is there room for the many, many upstarts to get in and dominate some of the space? As with any category, there are going to be winners and there will be losers. And I think what you see in the tech space in particular is this kind of movement towards category winners in kind of an almost um, monopoly-like way. Um, and so at Founders Fund, our strategy has always been quality over quantity. Uh, we're investors. We were investors in DeepMind before it was acquired yeah. by Google. We're, we have a big stake in OpenAI, in Scale, in Cognition, which is the new uh, AI coding platform. Um, not all AI companies, not all AI founders are created equal. Um, we're looking for density of talent on founding teams. And um, not all of these companies are going to work out. Oh, there's going to be a lot right. of money that's lost, but no different than in any other category. Like, you know, if you're a space tech investor and you didn't invest in SpaceX, you probably lost money. I think AI will look kind of similar. And for our audience in particular, that mostly looks at a lot of you know, public companies that are accessible to public investors. You just named a bunch of public names. So I want to ask you about the IPO market and when they might have a chance. And I want to play a soundbite for you. Greenlight Capital's David Einhorn uh, sat down with, with our team and at Scott Wapner at the Stone Conference. And he said that a lack of buyers is what's behind the slow IPO market. We're going to play it for you, and then I want to get your take. The S&P is making highs. Right? We're in a favorable economic environment, and yet where's the IPO market? Why aren't companies able to come public? And the reason is, is companies used to do these things called roadshows, and they would come to these managers, these long-only managers, and they'd say, hi, I'm the mid-cap manager of the such-and-such -such fund. Would you like to buy my new stock? And if that person isn't there or they don't have any new money, there's no one to buy that stock. And so you have a closed IPO market, even in the face of really, really uh, favorable market conditions. Trey, that was kind of a perspective I hadn't heard that often because I usually sit in San Francisco and talk to founders, many of whom kind of believe there's a bit of a stigma around going public, that you have to, you can't build for the longer term as well as you can if you're private. So what do you think of his comments and whether the IPO market is truly going to open up or not? Look, the reality is there aren't that many good growth companies out there. Uh, you know, I, you could probably name on one hand companies, public or private, that are doing better than 30 percent annual growth. Um, I spend a lot of time talking to growth investors, to bankers um, in my role as chairman at Anderil, and there are a lot of buyers. There are people that are interested in buying attractive mm -hmm. growth stocks that have kind of a generational category 
um, shifting technology or approach to an industry. Um, so while I think there's probably some truth to, uh, you know, there's not as much new money flowing in at the same time, uh, for the right stock, the macroeconomic condition matters a much, much less, I would say. Right. And Andrew, for example, is that a company that you think is a good candidate? Uh, not immediately. Not immediately. <laughs> um, we're we we're having conversations. <laughs> I, I think there's a window uh, that will make sense for us, uh, but certainly not in the next year. Well, last question for you. Um, I know that you guys are investors in OpenAI, and it still has this kind of unusual structure, right, of being a nonprofit. Is this a company and some of the other Gen AI companies, are they going to be able to actually be public companies if their mission is to serve humanity and not financial stakeholders? I don't think there's any inherent tension between being a publicly traded company and doing things that are important for humanity. Um, certainly, the, the structure of OpenAI is complicated, um, but I, I fully believe that the management team there is not only focused on things that are good for humanity, but they also do care about shareholders. Um, and I think that's why so many people have lined up looking to get into the business. Uh, you know, that, I don't think that would be the case if they thought there wasn't a financial opportunity on the other side.